Okay, so if H prime, stop me if I get it wrong, H prime is going to be what? 2 F of X, F prime of X, minus 2 G of X, G prime of X, right? And it says F prime of X equals negative G of X, and G of X, G prime of X is equal to F of X. So what do you do? Like play around with the substitutions a little bit or something like that? Right? I see. Oh, now. I okay, see. so f prime is this one, right? So what do you get? Two f of x times f prime of x, right? Minus two uh, g of x, and what's g prime of x equal to? F of x, like this. Oh, did I do neg? Oh, I didn't do the substitution. I'm sorry. I just. I'm sorry. I I, I did the arrow and then didn't do the substitution. I'm sorry. Like this? <laughs> Thank you. And then can you just factor some stuff out, like negative yeah. 2 or something? No, you just, you just you something together and it's negative 4. Oh, then you, oh, it is the same thing. Oh, look at that. So it's just going to be negative 4 f of x, g of x? I must have done That one? Yeah. Okay, good. Three? Well, I'm not, you, don't, you don't get this. You don't, how do you get a 3? <laughs> not everybody can eliminate all the answers like this all the time. That's how you can get a three. <laughs> it happens. Okay, so the real question now is figuring out which one of those two it is. So what does it really come down to? This entire question really comes down to what? Those limits. Those limits. <laughs> it really does. So we know it's going to be one half a to b of three plus cosine theta d theta. So first of all, it says the, the closed region, right? The closed region. Anybody know how to figure that out, Henry? Well, I. Thing. So Would you? Yeah, sure. That that is, when is when R gets to zero, right? Oh. So if you have a pedal, right, you'd have like something like this, right? You've seen that. Yes. But here's the thing: the thing we're looking at never goes below root two, right? And it goes all the way up to two. So it it has some path, right? Yes. And you know, I don't know what it looks like, but it's going to be like, and it comes back to there, right? Yes. The point is how you have to go all the way around. So what are we looking at? We're essentially we're just looking at one half. 0 to 2 pi of 3 plus cosine theta, right? But then you look at this and you're like, wait a minute, is it this one or is it that one, right? Here's the, th what do you have to do here? How do you, f how do you, do <laughs> what do you do? Cut it in half and multiply by 2? Close, you're really close. It's not just cut it in 2. Yeah, so here's the thing. The thing they're going to, what you need to figure out is that it turns out that each quadrant each of these four quadrants is going to be the same. It's going to repeat every pi over two. So what do they do? They just do. They pull out. They don't. They break it in half and then they break it in half again. So what do they actually pull this into? Four of them. They do four times one half. And instead of going from zero to two pi, they go from zero to pi over two of three plus. This is nasty. Yes, I agree that this is nasty. So what do you end up with? Two zero to pi over two of three plus cosine theta d theta. That's a nasty one. <laughs> I need a chaperone sometime through these problems. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I went a little overboard with the symmetry. It is not symmetric over the four quadrants. It's only symmetric. The x-axis. Sorry. It only is symmetric across the x-axis. So what do you do instead? You just pull out a 2, right? So it's going to be 2 times 0 to pi, right? Yeah, I didn't put it in there. The pen, uh, sorry. Sorry, I was I was over. It's a pen's problem. That's right. I'm I'm making excuses. So are we okay now? Yes. How do you know this? You know this again. This kind of trick is I've seen that happen. A few, you see that happen every now and then in any math field. That's the pulling stuff out of thin air move. How do the methods like how do methods like this get noticed? Someone works on it for a long time. And then they get really close to kind of doing it in reverse. And they're like, oh, wait, if I just, oh, I just start with this thing, right? Because, like, writing the numbers plus, plus one and minus one, that's, like, one of the simplest things you can do in mathematics, right? But if, if you look at all the possible things you can add and subtract, are there a lot of them? Yeah. Yes. There is a proof method where you add and subtract the same thing so you can, like, generate something that's nicely factorable or prove a trig identity, for example. Okay, moving on. Any other? Someone new. First of all, you might look at it and say, like, oh, you, can you do a U substitution? You can't do a U substitution on this thing, can you? No, but it's um, x one. Yeah, so when you do this, if you do this out, this is the same thing as if you algebraically, the square root of what? No, it's x minus 1 squared. x minus 1 squared, dx, right? So that's just x minus 1. So you're going to do the integral from 0 to 1 of what? x minus 1. Be really careful here. From x minus 1 
dx. Is that correct? Yeah, but I have a question for you. I, I have a quick. I have a question for you. You have to do some. This is this is where I can guarantee like forty percent of the people who do this problem get it wrong. Because here's the thing. Let's do a picture of this. What does that look like? X squared minus two x. What does that What does that graph look like? When you take the square root of something, it's only positive, right? It's only positive. So what do you have to actually put around this right here? You have to. Otherwise, the sign is going to be wrong. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Be really careful. Be really, really, really careful. So when you do this, how do you go about integrating something like this? The absolute value of so look, 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 hold on. Just the absolute value function here when you graph this, it's a piecewise function, right? You have to flip it over when it's below the one x-axis. The thing is, you're going from zero to one. Going from zero to one, it's going to be below it the entire time. So you can just take out. So you just take it out. So you make it you make it negative zero to one of this. This function has to be flipped for the entirety of zero to one. Does that make sense? Yeah. This is tricky, right? So now is it just a straight integration problem? Yeah. And it's going to be what one half? I think it's c. Otherwise, what are you going to get? Negative. And you're going to be like, yay, I did it. And then you're like. <laughs> so to do f prime of 1, we need to find f of x. That would be helpful, potentially. So you have to use logarithmic differentiation. So you have ln of y is equal to ln of this thing, right? But what's the nice thing about logs is you can pop the exponent down to the front. So you end up with ln y equals 2 minus 3x times ln of x. And now you can implicitly differentiate. So you get 1 over y, y prime is equal to the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first times the derivative of the second, which is times 2x, right? So you're like, oh, I'm cruising along. I'm like, okay, I'm like, oh, this is fine, right? We need y prime when this is 1, when x is 1, right? So you start plugging things in. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segment it. I know, but hold, give me a second. I know you did that on your map, but just give me a second. So negative 3 ln of what? 2 plus negative 1. 1 over 2 times 2, right? Yeah. So I'm cruising along. I'm like, okay, so y prime is equal to y evaluated at 1 times negative 3 ln 2 minus 1, right? Everybody with me so far? Yeah. I'm like, oh, y is 1. So how do we get y1? y1. We, it's just you plug 1 into this thing, right? Yeah, yeah. When you plug 1 into there, you get 1 to the negative, so you get 2 to the negative 1, right? So you get y prime is equal to 1 half times this, right? And you're like, okay. And then you look at the answers. What number was this, Matt? It's 38, you said? Yes. 38. So you go to 38. Let me just show you the answers. And you're like, oh, I'm cruising along. And you're like, damn it. It's not there. You're like, maybe that 1 isn't supposed to be there. Because what do you what do you think the answer is right now based on? You're like, oh, there's a 3 over, there's a negative 3 over 2, right? There's obviously no other one that could be like that. But that negative 1, I just did something wrong. That negative 1, I'm just going to delete, right? And I was like, something's bugging me about this. And this is, ready? Watch. Ready? 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 This is where it gets real fun, kids. So then I was like, huh, let me play around with this for like too long. This is the same thing as negative ln of 2 to the third, right? Yeah. Minus ln of uh, e. <laughs> <laughs> negative 1 half of ln of 8 plus ln of e. By the log rules, that's negative 1 half ln of 8e. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that right there, <laughs> that's, that's, that, that's some math teacher sitting around going, <laughs> no one's going to get this. <laughs> I don't know how many people would get that. I don't know really what 1969 was like. I know that only something like 380 kids took this exam. And man, they must have had fun. <laughs> but just like everything else you've done with intervals, you've got to test the endpoints. You've got to test the endpoints. So what are you really doing? You're doing the limit first as k goes to infinity of the nth plus 1 term, right? T divided by, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna multiply instead by just the reciprocal of the and the k the kth term, whatever you want to call it. It's fine. So you have to simplify this right here. So what do you end up with? You end up with k squared over k plus one squared, right? Times what? X plus one, exactly, because the k, the power cancels. You subtract k from k plus one. Isn't it? Now, what? X, isn't it x plus 1 divided by k plus 1? Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, wrote k plus 1. Uh, what, did I write something? It's k squared. It's these two right here, correct? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Right? No, I can cross multiply. It doesn't matter where they are. It's a product. So anyway, the idea though is k is going to what? 
infinity. So what does this go to? That goes to 1. So what are you left with? Just x plus 1, correct? And for this to converge, you need x plus 1 to be less than what? 1. You need it to be less. Remember the whole, remember this test? What's the test called? The what test? I thought it's the ratio of the value. It is. It is the absolute value. Ratio. Sorry. Yes. The ratio test, correct? Yeah. And you remember, there was the really pissy part was if it is equal to 1, does it tell you anything? No. It doesn't tell you anything. But you get to here, which means that x plus 1 has to be less than 1 or greater than the fact, the ratio test tells you that whatever you get, this is the limit. It's the limit The limit comes out to be the absolute value of x plus 1. This should have been the absolute value the whole time. The, whatever you get has to be less than 1 for it to converge. Wherever you can guarantee it is less than 1, it converges. Those values, right? So you get to this. So therefore, then you get to this, right? But here's the thing. So therefore, once you get that and you clip this in, it eliminates the first two a and b because a and b go from zero to two, not negative two to zero. But the problem now is not the problem. What do you how? What else do you have to do? The inequality. So you take this right here, okay? You're testing this when x is equal to the endpoints. When x is equal to the endpoints. Oh, stop it. So look, we have two endpoints to test. x is equal to zero. If we do that, you end up with the summation of k equals one to infinity of 1 over k squared. That's a p series, p greater than 1. So it, what does it do? It converges, right? And then you have this summation when x is equal to negative 2. You end up with negative 1 over k squared, right? Yeah. k equals 1 to infinity. Well, you especially know if this converges, this definitely, because that's going to be smaller, right? So by a lot of ways, you know that this also converges. So it has to be e, because it, the e is the only one that contains both endpoints. Does that make sense?